and happy International Women's Day to all. My name is Sandra Valenzuela, and I am the Chief Executive Officer at WWF Colombia. I have been working for at least 25 years on conservation, but mainly to promote access of land tenure rights to local communities displaced due to the armed conflict in my own country, and providing a voice to women belonging from different ethnic groups in their journey to access to natural resources. At the end of last year, I was honored by a recognition from the Human Economic Forum for my journey as a woman leader in conservation for the past decade. On this very special day, I'm pleased to welcome you to the webinar, Celebrating Women in Conservation. Why is gender equality and promoting women's leadership crucial for effective implementation of the Kunlun Montreal Global Biodiversity Agreement? This event is a collaboration between World Vision, Care International, Women for Biodiversity, and WWF. At WWF, we are very pleased to welcome, to welcome all of you for the third edition of the International Women's Day interagency celebration, especially today in the context of the inclusion of gender equality in the historic Cumen Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. As we all know, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity the CBD, as we call the COP16 held in Montreal at the end of uh, last year in Canada, governments adopted the landmark of the global biodiversity framework that commits countries to implement the national plans that can halt and reverse the loss of the biodiversity for a nature and people positive world. Especially, parties adopted a gender plan action, recognizing that the full and effective participation and leadership of women in all aspects of the global biodiversity framework process, as well as a new standalone target on gender equality. That means is the target 23rd. This target aspires to gender equality in the implementation of the framework, including the recognition of women and girls' rights to equally rights and access to land and nature and natural resources. The global biodiversity frameworks represent this time a big win. This target is a really big win for human rights, for more generally with a strong reference and commitments to ensure the access to justice and the information related to biodiversity by indigenous people, by local people, by other type of identities, respecting their cultures, their rights, their land, their territories, their resources, and the traditional knowledge. There is a growing evidence that nature conservation has been more successful where indigenous communities, women, and other, co and other uh, local communities have been able to bring their special skills and abilities and leadership mainly to natural resource management, land tenure, resulting in nature positive outcomes and improved livelihoods. Women's empowerment is therefore fundamental component of the nature development and humanitarian agenda. And that is why today, today's webinar is organizing by environmental, humanitarian and development organizations aiming to urge effective participation and leadership of women in implementing ambitious nature and sustainable development agendas. And personally delighted to see we are also joining by nearly more than 200 participants representing diverse perspectives and geographies of a truly global gathering. Today, we would like to do three main things. Promote the key leading roles that women play in protecting nature and contributing to sustainable use of natural resources. Second, urge effective participation and promotion of women's leadership for the global biodiversity framework implementation. And third, 
share good practices and local success stories, contributing to gender equality and the realization of women's involvement and leadership for achieving positive conservation results. We have an impressive speaker's lineup. High-level remarks from shortly be, be, will be delivered by Kirsten Schuitz, Director General from WWF International, and Sofia Spreschmann, Secretary General of Care International. After those opening remarks, I will invite Tina Rye, Executive Director uh, for a Woman uh, for Biodiversity, and Hindo Humario Ibrahim, the President, Association for an Indigenous Woman and Peoples of Chad, to share her perspectives on the Global Biodiversity Foundations and setting the stage for the best practice discussion. Now, where we will be here from Mona Stella Mariano, the World Vision Asia Pacific Office, and Shikwi Mambida, Care International, Care Zambia representative. From there, we will move in from the QA questions and session, inviting the whole audience. So, all of us, we are able to pose questions to speakers. Please use the chat and, uh, and use the QA function on the bottom of your screens to pose a question throughout the webinar. And let us know your name and organization too, so we can follow up afterwards. We will call on your on speakers to answer a selection of different type of questions depending of the question that you and all of us will be posing in the chat. The session will be recorded and made available after the webinar, along with the key messages and takeaway, and especially the call to action. Thanks for all your attention and being part of this discussion and to really start moving forward in our own countries. I will now invite our two key speakers to open the webinar. Kirsten Schutz, Director General of WWF International. Welcome. I'm absolutely delighted to have you here in the International Women Day, the webinar to celebrate women in conservation. As the audience knows, Kirsten, is the newly appointed international WWF director. And she's the first woman ever to hold this position. Kirsten has a lifelong conservation and vocal advocate for nature who first began her association with WWF as a youth volunteer ranger. She has been with WWF for almost 20 years in various international global conservation positions, where she was also led transformational programs for inclusive conservation and climate justice. Kirsten, as we celebrate Women in Conservation, we are pleased to hear your reflections and comments about the importance of women equal participation and leadership in natural resources management and conservation uh, practices. Kirsten, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sandra, for your very kind introduction. Uh, and hi, everybody. So great uh, to see so many people uh, joining this webinar. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today. And I would also like to commend the interagency collaboration between WWF, World Vision, and CARE International. And the fact that we are celebrating International Women's Day together for the third time in a row, for the third year in a row, clearly shows that the development humanitarian and environmental agendas have a strong converging point in gender equality, which is great to see. Now, we all know that we're facing a climate and a biodiversity crisis, and this is no longer just an environmental issue. In fact, it's a question of social equity and of human rights. The loss and degradation of biodiversity affects people in many different ways, with women and girls often facing greater disadvantages. In areas where livelihoods depend on nature, women play a key role in the use and management of natural resources. The loss of nature therefore threatens the livelihoods, access to food, to water, to energy, basic things. It also gives rise to rural poverty and deepens the social and gender divide. In addition, women and girls can be subject to harmful social and gender norms, institutional barriers and rights denial. So ensuring land ownership and rights for women can enable them to have more substantive engagement in decision-making processes and can strengthen their capacity and incentive to invest 
in sustainable practices. While participation in itself is a fundamental right, there is a growing evidence that shows that increased involvement of women in local resource management and decision making actually leads to much better resource governance, management and conservation outcomes. And that success rates of community-based natural resource management are impacted positively when more women participate in decision-making processes. So addressing gender inequality means addressing the structural factors that undermine environmental sustainability. It is a conservation imperative. Mainstreaming of gender equality and social inclusion of economically disadvantaged and marginalized women is an important part of WWF's inclusive conservation agenda. Let me give you three examples of where we do this as WWF globally. The first example comes from Nepal, where WWF works with partners to help women adapt to climate change. As part of a project, we have developed a process that empowers marginalized women to participate actively in community adaptation. This includes identifying their specific climate vulnerabilities and ensuring that solutions for them are included in local adaptation plans. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, WWF works with women's associations on raising awareness on women's rights in natural resource management. We train facilitators that accompany them in discussions with authorities to obtain legal documents for securing community land through their officially recognized associations. And lastly, gender dynamics also infuses the illegal wildlife trade. A gender blind approach to illegal wildlife results in huge gaps in understanding of real world illegal wildlife trade activities, processes and opportunities for intervention. And in this context, WWF developed an analysis of gender and illegal wildlife trade and a toolkit for integrating gender into counter illegal wildlife trade approaches. So looking forward to the future and also the topic of this webinar, um, in December 2022, we celebrated a historical success for conservation as world governments adopted a landmark global biodiversity framework, the GBF, that commits countries to implement national plans that can halt and reverse the loss of biodiversity, enhance women's leadership in conservation, and promote human rights. This is an unmissable opportunity for governments to adopt and implement lasting measures that will positively impact both people and nature, and especially women and girls, for decades to come. I look very much forward to working with all of you to promote cross-sectoral partnerships, like the ones we're also celebrating today, by bringing conservation and development agendas together for the benefit for people and planet. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Kirsten. I think uh, you set up the stage in terms of defining the importance of the women's role and leadership in biodiversity and really uh, moving ahead to reduce the, the forest loss, the biodiversity loss, uh, while uh, we really convene the human rights and the land tenure and the access for natural resources. Thank you very much. And you remind me when I was in Montreal celebrating uh, the, the signature of the agreement and that we, are that we were really uh, happy and, uh, and moving forward to really be part of the implementation of the Target 23rd. And so thank you for really putting us in context. So I will start giving uh, the, the word uh, to uh, Sonia Spreschmann. Uh, forgive me if I pronounce uh, badly, my German is coming. Uh, she's uh, the Secretary General from CARE International. Sophia, it's a pleasure to welcome you as well on board to this joint webinar. Sophia is the Secretary General of CARE International, and CARE has been a long-standing supporter of nature and people positive agenda, including through the CARE and WWF Alliance to integrate conservation and development for more than 10 years. Over this past decade, biodiversity loss has undeniably impacted people's lives. It has led to increased poverty and social inequality with the most vulnerable population hit first and hardest. Sophia, please 
Tell us more about the humanitarian environmental nexus in the context of the climate and biodiversity multiple crisis and curse advocacy role for nature and people positive under the global biodiversity framework. The, the floor is yours, Sophia. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so very much. And, uh, and welcome to the third interagency International Women's Day celebration that brings together development, humanitarian and conservation communities. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here with you today. This is an important day for all of us. And of course, happy International Women's Day. As you well said, it is well known that the climate emergency and nature crisis threaten the benefits and progress already made in addressing the injustice of poverty and gender inequalities, while also increasing the demand to respond to urgent humanitarian needs. That is why these partnerships between conservation, development, and humanitarian organizations are so important, both in our on-the-ground work and also in advocating for change at the global level. Let me make actually two important points. Once I, I do want to set what you just said, Sandra, this the stage for you know, this nexus or this connection between the environmental and humanitarian crisis. Humanity is of course facing a difficult time, an interrelated crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss. Poverty and environmental degradation are two sides of the same coin. We can only build inclusive societies if we protect the ecosystems on which we all rely. Marginalized communities are the most impacted by climate and nature crisis, yet are, as we all know, the least responsible. To protect the ecosystems, we need to address the underlying causes of poverty and social injustice by strengthening equality, including, and very fundamentally, gender equity and women's voices. The most marginalized communities in developing countries, and specifically women and girls, disproportionately bear the impacts of climate change with increasingly severe weather changes that directly affect livelihoods and food security. We know that women are often the key to creating lasting solutions with communities, and that when they are involved in natural resource management and leadership, conservation outcomes and climate change policies improve. However, women often lack the resources and opportunities needed for their voices to be heard in influencing decisions that affect them the most. My second point, the importance of advocacy for a nature and people positive world. And CARE, of course, has been very involved in this advocacy and celebrates the historic inclusion of gender equality in the landmark coming Montreal Global Bi Biodiversity Framework, in which world governments outline a new set of goals and targets to halt and reverse biodiversity loss by the end of the decade. The focus of Target 23 on equal rights and access to land and natural resources as well as on, as, uh, on full equitable participation and on leadership in decision-making related to biodiversity is truly, I think we all will agree, a significant step forward in the recognition of the crucial role women play in caring for our planet. CARE is really exceptionally proud of having participated in the nature and people positive movement over the past three years. Together with our development and humanitarian organizations, we have made numerous calls to action, urging governments to adopt a gender equal agreement for nature and people. However, the success of the global biodiversity framework cannot be taken for granted. Governments must put environmental justice, social justice and, justice and human rights at the center of the implementation strategies of the framework. Now it is really up to the whole of society to turn the tide on nature loss and to secure an equitable and just future for all. So let me conclude by saying that 
we have heard it said before that there is no social justice without nature's conservation and conservation efforts cannot succeed without social justice, yet rhetoric is nothing without action. One very concrete example of this working in practice is within the CARE WWF Alliance, uh, a partnership that actually has existed since 2008, which we are so thrilled about, by bridging the expertise from both organizations in development and conservation respectively, the Alliance works to ensure that communities impacted by climate change are engaged in mitigation and adaptation solutions that also improve their lives. The new initiative under development by both of us, CARE and WWF, which is called Sewing Change, will work directly with women to develop nature positive livelihoods and women led solutions to community challenges. We'll be hearing more about this from Chikwe, the country director of CARE Zambia, where we will launch a Sewing Change pilot. I look forward to hearing from Chikwe and all panelists on how we can further promote and support women in playing effective and leading roles in implementing the global biodiversity framework. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you, Sophia. I think uh, you set the stage in terms of the, the multiple challenges that we have to address the, the reduction of the the, the biodiversity, the biodiversity loss, and uh, our health as humans, but also in the way to promote social justice, social inclusion, climate justice, and all these interrelation uh, and interlinked agendas that uh, really will make possible uh, because of the empowerment and the voices and the leadership of women because of the role uh, that we all have uh, to play uh, within in terms of the decision making, in terms of the, the ground uh, conservation uh, work in terms of the households and so on. So thank you, Sophia, because really is a link between the, the humanitarian development and environmental and social agenda that is really uh, making uh, a step forward uh, to overcome this multiple crisis. So uh, saying that, so we will be uh, going to the second part of uh, our celebration of human in conservation in terms of uh, giving the floor to Mirlani uh, Tina, a uh, Roy Executive Director, a uh, woman for biodiversity. It's now my pleasure to invite you to the floor uh, since you are a convener of the CVD uh, or the Convention of the Biodiversity Women's and Gender Caucasus and to share your reflections on how to really implement and call to action to the different governments, to the different uh, business communities and organizations to really provide outcomes uh, to the implementation of the Target 23rd and, and really promote the gender equity and the gender leadership. So Tina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sandra, very much for this invitation to all the colleagues. I'm going to share my presentation, so please let me know if you're able to see it. Go ahead. I think it should present. You, you should put it present full screen, uh, Tina. Yeah, sorry. Um, I have a little bit, I'm, I'm somewhere out, so my... Um... It's getting great. Okay. All right. Thank you. So let me know if there's a glitch uh, because I'm traveling. So I might, uh, internet is a bit unstable and I think my screen started off a bit late. So thank you so very much for this invitation. Um, I will just skip this page. I just wanted to share some of these amazing women who are part of the CBD Women's Caucus and also others, um, allies who were there at COP15, smiley faces. We were very um, uh, big force this time at the CBD. Um, so before we go on the target um, 23 and the advancement of gender in the CBD, considering that maybe it might be important to run this, I'm just going to quickly, briefly go 
through this one, so understanding the context of gender in the work of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. So one of the um, one of the main thing um, that is for us to always remember um, is that that the uh, the 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 text of the CVD in this preambular actually recognizes the close and traditional dependence of many indigenous and local communities. It also recognizes and affirms the full participation of women at all levels of um, policy making. And also um, talks about the importance of meeting the food, health, and other need of the growing world population. And this is also very um, important in the context of the, some of the decisions that were undertaken at the COP15. Uh, the work of gender in the CBD has been long enough because the CBD is actually the first Rio Convention to have had a gender plan of action. And in the uh, the strategic plan for biodiversity, and many of you know as the uh, also the ICHA biodiversity target, uh, that also had asked for mainstreaming gender considerations. And in COP12 in Pyeongchang in 2014, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, adopted its gender plan of action from 2015 to 2020 to align with the strategic plan for biodiversity and the ICHA biodiversity targets. Now I'm going to skip because my time is very limited. So um, thank you so very much. The speakers have already talked about the background of the COP um, and the importance. So I won't really go on. You know, we all, I think, know, we all understand. And I think it's, it's about time for us to really kind of get into action of what came out of the COP15 that took place in Montreal. So one of the agenda that discussed the global biodiversity target has now got 23 targets, uh, which has replaced the ICHA biodiversity target. Now, when we're talking about um, a lot of the elements the speakers talked about um, are also really very relevant because when you're talking about um, conservation, you're talking about rights, uh, there are some of the key elements within the whole framework. I've only taken specific on gender, but also looking at that these perspectives um, are being brought forward into this COP15 decision also from a human rights-based approach. And the CBD, uh, the, there's a section on looking at and has recognized um, human rights and right to a healthy environment. Now, specific on target 22 also, I'm really happy to say that we were able to retain, um, I'm sharing this was really very important is that, that even target 22 talks about gender responsive representation, participation, decision-making, justice, information, and also the protection of environmental human rights defenders, many of, the, many of whom or also women. Now, I'm sorry, I'll lose my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? You have to come back and uh, and return it. We, yes, we lost your screen maybe because of your internet connection. Uh, okay, sorry, I'll, I'll share it again. In Um, yeah, sorry about that. No, but it's, it's very important the link that uh, you are doing in terms of the target 22 and target 23rd because it's complementary between each other to make it more uh, enforceable, the action plans at the government and regional and global levels. Thank you very much for this framework, yeah. Tina. Can you see my screen back now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So now what we're really targeting on is a big win for, I suppose, not only the work of the Women for Biodiversity or the Women's Caucus, it's only some of them. It is, I tell people, it's the ownership. It belongs to everybody. It is a really monumental work that uh, we undertook uh, four years ago. We have been working, like I said, on the gender plan of action um, uh, during the COP12. But when the opportunity opened up, for having a new global biodiversity framework, we really saw this as an opportunity that let's strive, let's strive for more. This is an opportunity that is going to be looking at, it is looking at a vision for living in harmony with nature until 2050, that's 30 years. So we cannot just stand by and say, we, we know we will do that later. So we saw this as an opportunity now. And of course the pandemic happened, you know, the COP15 uh, got postponed. So we've really been working around that and, 
uh, just to say that with all the work um, and all the collaborations, uh, the amazing work that our members have done, our allies have partnered with, we got Target 20 through. For the first time ever in any of the Rio conventions, um, is this has hopefully set the tone, not only for the CBD, but also ensuring that hopefully that this is going to be the baseline for also all the other Rios, all the other MEAs to ensure that now they need to step up. Now, the target 23 talks about the implementation of the framework uh, to be gender responsive. And it, besides the opportunity and the capacity, one of the key elements that the target has is says that it contributes to the three objectives of the convention. The three objectives of the convention is not only conservation, it's conservation, it's sustainable use, and access and benefit sharing. So those are the three elements. So this really target encompasses those three elements. So we really need to also broaden our scope of saying that you know it's not only conservation initiatives of the CBD or biodiversity, but also the others, and these could include um, all the other 22 targets. And of course, this is by saying that recognizing their equal rights and access to lands and natural resources. This is again something that we have been fighting for uh, for a long time, because you know, when we're talking about human rights, we're talking about how do we address the gender inequalities and how do we really bridge that gap? It will not happen when we don't recognize the basic rights, the rights to land, the rights to access to resources, because if you don't have that, you can't decide on that. And of course, in informed participation and leadership of uh, odd levels of actions, engagement policy and decision-making related to biodiversity. Now, um, I'm just giving a quick synopsis of the outcomes. Now, key element like I talked about was in Pyeongchang in 2014, COP12, uh, the the agenda plan of action was adopted. So this is not, so the, the two elements of the COP15 was, uh, one was the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, but it was also adopt um, a post, what we call the post-2020 gender plan of action to align with the whole global biodiversity framework, which is now the Kunming Montreal um, GBF. Now, this new gender plan of action is really very amb ambitious. The initial gender plan of action had very limited activities. Um, a lot of them was more in capacity building. Um, but this one, and I think that was the whole part that you, if you need to have gender responsive, parties need to also ensure that they take ownership of this one. And in this gender plan of action, it has three um, objectives. Um, and then um, I just want to give a quick glance uh, of the outcomes. So the whole framework sets the tone. So there are 15 objectives and there are 30 indicative actions. However, the time frame we have right now is seven years. All those actions are until 2030. And of course, the parties or, the, or are there are uh, the, the parties to the convention, the CBD secretariat, organizations, women's groups, and the global environmental facility. Um, so um, this is, I think, one of my second last slides. Um, so that is what happened in a very small nutshell of the outcome of the COP15. Now, the time for us, uh, I feel which you don't have time, is, is unraveling all those intricate aspirations and actions that have been put forward into our own work at the national level. Now the global framework has given it it. Now the work uh, is that how will we really work forward or ensuring those things. And I put this up here um, on gender responsiveness is because this was a discussion that had come also in a lot of discussions whether gender responsiveness is is same as gender, gender sensitivity and how do we really go about it? So we just explained to like the party saying that, look, you know, gender responses being going beyond being sensitive and it's beyond just saying that, okay, we know about it, but it's about time that we be gender responsive because that plays on the actions that you will pay forward to bridge those gaps of inequality in addressing human rights and rights of women. These are some of key key points that I wanted all of us to um, look about is we need to have the analysis. We've always talked about uh, disaggregated data. 
We always talk about actions. We need to have these actions. A lot of them will happen on the ground, which one of them is, say, for example, uh, the NBSAP, the National Biodiversity and Strategy and Action Plans, that the parties will be either updating, reviewing, of course, um, until next year where at COP16, uh, the NBSAPs will also be coming up. The other one are on indicators. We have a target. Now, what the work is around is that to operationalize the target, you need indicators. Now, it's not the question of saying we need indicators. We need to work around is saying, are those appropriate indicators that addresses the outcome or the actions in targets 22 and 23? And of course, this was one of the key elements that we really struggled about in the COP15 was the gender plan of action. And we have a two target. We need funding, we need the financial resource mechanism, mechanism to really address that you have a gender plan of action, you have the target 23, you need to have targeted funding to ensure that there will be funds for including supporting Indigenous women's or women's organizations to build that work on the ground. And of course, um, addressing um, human rights. Um, sorry. Uh, so I, that's my last slide, but I really couldn't um, finish off by also saying that, that a lot of our work, a lot of the advocacy, uh, what we have brought to the COP15 and all the work of the convention and other international arenas would not also be complete without really recognizing the true agents of change, or I would say the heroines of our work where they're on the ground, they are working, they're actually doing the work. So we need to see how can we also connect those local initiatives that are being done with the support of funding, with this advocacy that has happened. Otherwise, again, the GBF is going, only going to be aspirational, the aspiration for having a inclusive, transformative process and, and addressing, we will leave half of the world's population behind if you really don't keep this in mind going forward. So happy International Women's Day. So this is um, our colleague, our member from the Solomon Islands, which we are whom we are partnering with uh, from the organization of Network for Indigenous Peoples from the Solomon Islands, Nestor. And, um, and this is what I just want, it's a one minute, if you'll just bear with me and that'll be the end of my presentation. This one or the strings from the fala, where uh, every potent tools from the fala, because if I got him on the his cells, even on the rocks, or any kind of something except on the small strings from the fala, I mean, important to us too, for me fala, got him on the clean waters, because every water from the fala, he cut through a lot of forest. Me, me, not for uh, talent, uh, nation, for or the big man from Mifala, and or the government from Mifala, and also the nation now, the whole world now, that Mifala also got a role inside the, uh, inside the, or the communities from Mifala. Mifala or the mamis, and Mifala or the women, 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 whole world or the people or the big man or the recognizing Mifala. That Mifala also imposed us at the community. So thank you so very much. And um, I think um, um, we can share our, our, our website is here, um, email is there, and you can definitely find us on social media. So such a back to you. Thank you so very much for this opportunity and for the participants attending. Um, I give a very brief uh, synopsis of the outcome, but I'm happy here to uh, share any um, responses, questions, or please feel free to also reach out to me. So thank you so very much and happy International Women's Day to everybody. Thank you, uh, Tina. Uh, you as the executive director for human uh, for biodiversity you gave us a deep dive into 
uh, what we meant about the, the target 22 and target 23 in terms of the, the global biodiversity agenda into bringing and empowering a woman into conservation, into biodiversity, into leadership. And as you just told us, how is important the relation between the human rights, the social justice, the equity, the voices, the participation, the inclusion, uh, and the climate adjusting in terms of land tenure rights, in terms of natural resources uh, and, and uh, food economies uh, and so on, in terms of not only setting the stage in the political level in convening different stakeholders and actors, but a call to action in terms of developing the national uh, action plans that we need to develop uh, uh, all this year and, and, and for the next COP and with key indicators, with key actions linking what you just show in the video that is very powerful, that is the voices uh, from uh, the, the, the communities that they are the owners uh, of our land and the, the resources and the policy makers and who are driving the whole development uh, and the economic agenda. So thank you because you really drove us into what we are aiming for in terms of really uh, having the opportunity to understand uh, the role of women in conservation. So, uh, uh, giving uh, the, the, the stage to Mona Estela uh, Mariano. And beforehand, I want to apologize that Hindu Omaru Ibrahim, uh, the president of the association from the indigenous women and people of Chad, she was not going to be able to join us today because uh, she was uh, flying and her flight uh, got uh, very delayed so she could uh, join us. So uh, Mona, uh, uh, I will give you uh, the floor. Uh, you are the regional advisor for the gender equality and social inclusion for the World Vision Asia Pacific. So Mona is presenting a, a practical case in terms of women's empowerment in anticipatory action in Mongolia in the face of extreme weather conditions and, uh, and how uh, the biodiversity laws uh, are really exacerbating uh, the climate change and the conditionality and the vulnerability of women. So please, Mona, the floor is yours and delighted uh, to learn from you. Thank you very much, Sandra. You would have to excuse my voice, everyone. My throat is recovering, but still very delighted to be here and participate in, in this um, very marvelous um, panel. Let me just share my screen. We are. Uh, you are set. Yeah. We at World Vision realize the very critical role of the environment and conservation as we promote the well being of girls and boys in the communities we work in across Asia and the Pacific. And most of the vulnerabilities we see and tackle every day are very much interrelated with the gender and the status of the communities. And that is why we continuously advocate for climate justice for children. If um, threats and risks are there, it adds to the gender inequalities that, are, that they are already experiencing. And this would be um, hunger, malnutrition, disasters, and violence. From the north side of um, Asia in Mongolia to the countries in the middle and the southern side like Myanmar and the Solomon Islands, we directly witness how climate and the environment health are very much linked with the status of women and girls in the community. And as you would see here in the quote by um, a 17 year old girl from Mongolia, Numundari, um, she mentions that it is our earth and she recognizes that um, climate change is affecting them directly. And that is why we uh, support the call to governments together with WWF, CARE, and other organizations globally to have an ambitious post-2020 biodiversity agreement. World Vision has several approaches in relation to the GBF, and I will be sharing two of them today, one of which is on systems building and the other on meaningful participation. One approach where we are seeing gains 
um, is through systems building, which contributes to the global diversity framework's target around increasing resilience of communities and its members. We create enabling conditions in communities that promote equitable access to uh, resources and services and really spaces for meaningful engagement, not just of um, women particularly, but uh, of girls. One of the women that we work with, whom you are seeing in this photo, is Mrs. Hong. She comes from the uh, Min Long District of Vietnam. And that area of, uh, in that region is where the typhoons and extreme weather cause dire casualties and huge damages in agriculture production and infrastructure every year. So imagine the stress that they would have to go through thinking about uh, food for their households, thinking about how they would survive the next day. And what World Vision is doing in its uh, recovery and resilience program, we work with the disadvantaged households, particularly the women, on climate smart agriculture trainings and um, community preparedness to make sure that they are more resilient against these disasters. This is very much in line with another um, systems building initiative that we have around anticipatory action. Anticipatory action, if I may just quickly explain, is a set of measures taken to mitigate potential disaster impacts before they happen. We have seen the significance of the role of women and girls in resilience building, and this actually resulted to an ASEAN training module on gender and inclusive anticipatory action that was developed in partnership with the EU, with Plan International, and with CARE. It is also under the systems um, strengthening that a significant part of our work on child protection against various forms of violence, including gender-based uh, gender violence, come in. We value the global diversity framework's implementation measures that acknowledges the women and um, girls' rights to a secure um, and healthy and peaceful environment. And we contribute here by working with communities and governments at different levels to strengthen child protection systems and policies. We at World Vision pay particular attention to communities that are prone to climate crisis, as this provides us more um, opportunities to help those at risk as they are more marginalized, especially if under um, duress during, um, during disasters. In this photo, you would see um, another approach that uh, we are working on, and this is uh, very much in line again with the GB GBF, um, and this is on participation. We see girls and women that, um, being more prone to experience the gender impacts of climate change, and they do not have the equal voice in decision making, nor in the policies that, that um, revolve around it. And what we do as an organization, we ensure active participation of women and girls by providing them with safe spaces to contribute in um, the community disaster management planning and awareness raising. In Myanmar particularly, we capacitate and work with girls as they aspire to be climate change champions. Through um, support, through the support that we give to children's groups, we we help them raise awareness about climate issues. We help them um, raise their voices and link it with their community leaders to make sure that their voices count. Children like um, Cherry from Myanmar, especially girls, are often um, not taken seriously or engaged at all in climate action and in climate change discussions. And it is very critical that we hold that, that space for them, allowing them to, to know and exercise their rights and be protected while doing so. So in the recent speech of the UN Secretary General Guterres, if, if you have heard him, um, he mentioned that it will take 300 years more before gender equality is actually achieved. And we do see the hurd hurdles and barriers, including in the area of biodiversity. And though the, the end goal is quite far, we acknowledge that women and girls are becoming more active in climate change and community resilience discussions, be it in uh, formal and informal spaces. We also see that um, their strength, you know, it's really genuine and the passion um, in engaging in this area bringing in their experiences and innovations around what will 
holistically and sustainably benefit their communities and their families. And to be able to do this, uh, we really encourage um, um, to support the GBF target on access to justice and information, as well as the full protection of environmental um, human rights defenders, particularly uh, children as they engage in this space. Um, women and girls need the support to ensure that they have safe spaces to contribute, especially important that we see uh, civil society spaces becoming more uh, restricted in the recent years. We also see that having women as positive role models in various community spaces um, challenge the, the existing gender norms and challenge the perceptions of girls and boys. And this is quite important as, as uh, we pursue um, having uh, recognizing the voices of women in the communities. Changing deeply ingrained norms and behavior require investment and support from different levels of the communities, thus collaboration within thematic sectors and organizations. And I'm happy that um, all of us are here in this um, session now. You know, we widen the reach and create more sustainable change. So to, to end, we at World Vision really see the environment rapidly changing its nature and characteristics. And that's it affects biodiversity, it also affects the well-being of the girls and boys whom we serve. Harnessing the force of women and girls and um, what they bring in and continuously learning from them and with them in the significant steps to understand how to support their communities would really uh, build towards inclusive and sustainable growth. Um, if you would really, if you would want to know more about our work, we'd encourage you to visit this space. You can also just scan this QR code to um, see our work in Asia Pacific. Thank you very much. Over to you. Uh, Mona, uh, thank you for uh, driving us for a practical case from Asia, from the World Vision. And, uh, and your learnings. I, I wanted to highlight uh, a few things that you just uh, shared. Thank you very much. The, the active and the roles models. No? So all, uh, uh, all different roles in a society has a, a, a role uh, and uh, for, to reduce the vulnerability because of climate change. So you just highlighted the technical empowerment for women, for girls, for youth, in terms of being having a voice, having technical expertise, being aware to really act and the end really being able to uh, uh, reduce the vulnerability in terms of an extreme weather event. So this is part of uh, what we want, a uh, woman in conservation, kids in conservation, different type of roles, uh, models as you just uh, mentioned in terms of really empowerment for a climate justice and, and human rights uh, protection and also having a safe sp a space for acting towards uh, the reduction of climate vulnerability in communities affected uh, such as uh, women and, and girls. Uh, and boys. So thank you very much. Is the Asian uh, World Vision perspective, Mona. And now I'm going to give the floor to Africa side uh, with uh, our Chiki Mimbuya, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, country director at CARE in Zambia. So we will see now the Africa context in terms of presenting WWF and CARE Alliance uh, implementation uh, in that uh, region of the world, uh, working directly with women to develop nature positive livelihoods and, and human led solutions to community challenges. So Chiki West, the floor is yours and thank you to driving us to Africa. Thank you. So thank you so very much, Sandra. And uh, just do that. Yeah, so thank you very much, Sandra. Um, and uh, thank you to the, the people that have actually joined this webinar.
So the more I meet my conservation uh, partners and also engage in the discussions around natural resources and ecosystems, I really become much more convinced that uh, there's really need for development, humanitarian and conservation agencies to actually unite and work together. What is really clear is that uh, there's an accumulation of risks and threats to nature that is threatening our very existence. And this makes this discussion quite urgent because of course we know that rights are universal and they are something that we can all converge um, around and allow us to find solutions across the different silos and, and sectors. So at CARE, we firmly believe that social justice, equity and human rights should be the center of solutions to biodiversity crisis. Of course, um, we have uh, our global strategy, which is really focusing on this arena that focuses on the right to food, water and nutrition. And I must say that uh, the importance of rights and also the targets in the GBF, from my perspective, of course, uh, cannot be overemphasized because these people and communities who experience the most severe impacts of biodiversity loss are those already extremely vulnerable. They face intersectional vulnerability, of course. And then of that intersection of vulnerability, we're looking at them facing uh, food insecurity, hunger, malnutrition, among the many challenges, and this is, of course, because of um, poverty, injustice, and the pervasive uh, denial of their, of their rights. So just sharing this bit of CARE's uh, gender equality framework that really look, looks at um, building agency, transforming structures, and also changing our relations, and linking to our conversation and discussion today, it actually means that our solutions to the challenges for communities lie definitely within their own capacities and their own agencies. But of course, they must be uh, uh, protected by the full spectrum of, of rights. For our gender equality framework, this is actually widely used in our agricultural livelihood and climate change adaptation uh, programming, where we've actually realized that we need to move from a point where there's a lot of exploitative, but to more transformative, of course, um, uh, gender within, within our, our programming. So in relation to, as I talked about our livelihoods challenges in bi uh, biodiverse ecosystems with these groups, which of course are known to have uh, their, uh, their rights denied, there's definitely uh, a critical success within the GBF framework. I know that um, there was already mentioned, I think by, by Kristen, uh, of women's uh, tenure rights, which is definitely an obvious area for our attention. And also we can only build inclusive societies if we protect the ecosystems on which the poor definitely rely and to protect our ecosystems. We also need to address the underlying causes of poverty and social injustice by strengthening equality, which definitely means uh, gender equality. So there's really no social justice without successful conservation of nature and conservation efforts cannot succeed without social justice. So if certain policies around even linking with our framework here, if certain policies um, aimed at enhancing biodiversity imply the displacement of people, loss of livelihood or denial of rights, then we are definitely exacerbating uh, poverty and in inequity. So this is where what we're talking about, our work, our programming in Zambia and across the world is really speaking around um, this particular framework. And I just want to speak to the CARE and WWF Alliance which uh, since its inception, we've actually been working together in Mozambique, Tanzania and Nepal. And of course the Alliance really serves as a thought leader and working around, you know, convening partners, looking at research evidence and also sharing uh, learning. So some of the examples that we've done uh, within this uh, Alliance have included the Coral Reef Rescue Initiative, and this really program is about uh, safeguarding the critical ecosystems as part of protecting the livelihoods of people 
who depend upon them. We cannot really aspire to saving reefs, which are providers of livelihoods and nutrition for millions of people, if we continue polluting our rivers and driving up ocean temperatures. So this is one pretty much example of how we're working within uh, this uh, partnership. So the Alliance brings together, of course, the expertise and skills that address complex issues around uh, climate change and get to the root causes of what, uh, you know, what causes these same complex issues. We were also looking at making sure that we enhance this partnership so that we can actually achieve more working together, you know, because you cannot achieve a healthy, of course, um, ecosystem without healthy and thriving uh, communities. And if you cannot have healthy and thriving communities, then there's no healthy e ecosystems that they can also be able to depend on. So one of the things that is really interesting about this alliance is the fact that uh, the organization actually overlap in over 40 countries where we have the potential to create uh, the large scale impact. And this is part of the reasoning why we've actually launched the new program, which is called Sowing Change. Uh, Sophia did uh, mention about uh, the sowing change. So I'm just going to speak to this sowing change initiative that uh, we just uh, launched in Zambia, working together with WWF in Zambia. So this is really about a seed movement that can change the world uh, by tapping the power of women's leadership and also collective power to promote the ecosystem restoration and respond to climate changes. So these are the three objectives which we're really focusing on, where we're looking at climate adapted nature-based livelihoods, and also the objective two, which is looking at community-led climate solutions and also large uh, scale restoration and climate leadership. So around this, we know that we do have high impact uh, areas that are looking at, um, of course, creating more resilient, I mean, uh, communities that are more resilient to climate change. We look at making sure that uh, the transformed uh, gender norms increase women's power over their livelihoods and certainly over their lives. We're also looking at uh, private sector and public financing, these flaws that are now fast increasing for the women, for their small scale uh, green enterprises and also locally led uh, climate solutions. Another impact area we're focusing on is looking at um, uh, restoration initiatives from community to landscape skills and, and access and adopt uh, native species for target ecosystems. Ultimately, we want to be looking at nature-based enterprises beyond just nurseries. So within the concept that we're looking at the sowing change in, in Zambia, we are looking around, like we said, beyond nursery. So we're looking around uh, particular species, which are like, for example, the marula tree, uh, where they can actually be able to now uh, process the seed and, and other uh, tree uh, nurseries that uh, these communities can actually be able to grow and uh, be able to, to sell within, within their communities. Now, a specific example speaking to how these women are leading um, uh, in terms of climate change. I've got this example of uh, Eunice, who is a 47-year-old woman. She's a single mother with three kids. She's from a particular village in, in Kalomo, and Kalomo is one of the most uh, affected, of course, uh, locations on, uh, in terms of climate change in Zambia, and has just been experiencing uh, flash floods and sometimes droughts in these same communities. Eunice is a member of uh, one of our care-supported farmer field business schools, where we've trained them in different uh, aspects in terms of uh, marketing, identifying the right uh, value chains, access to market, financing, and all the works and talking uh, about uh, gender equality. And what she's now doing, as you can see from her picture, she's now using the modern farming practices yeah, to improve uh, the soil health and its productivity. She's also a lead farmer. So which means she's actually, she, when we're talking about the gender equality framework and the issue of agency, she's got the confidence and she's got the skills from the training uh, from these uh, farmer field business schools. She's now assertive enough to lead a group of over 30 farmers. These are a mix of men and women where she provides extension services um, 
to follow these same similar practices. And now what they've been doing in support of, of course, the GBF, it's, it's really looking at how can they collectively work and, and practice their assisted natural regeneration so that they can actually restore their ecosystem around. So what she's doing, there's in, in their community, there's actually um, some disturbed forests. Of course, these are forests where there's been a lot of uh, firewood and uh, burning of uh, bushes for their own uh, farmland. But what they've done is that to ensure that they're inculcating a knowledge where they can actually preserve and regenerate these uh, 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 forests. And what she's actually doing is, is now to make sure that she's building awareness around uh, these communities to talk about, of course, the laws around, um, you know, uh, 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 I mean, of course, burning charcoal and 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 all the other bits that uh, is is happening within uh, within their communities that is affecting their soil productivity. The other bit that she's done from the learning is uh, she's also looking at uh, sustainable regenerative agriculture, which is really linked to climate smart agriculture practices. Where we've given an example there, with, she's using the mulch where she does uh, the grass cover to ensure that uh, there's a lot of uh, water that is uh, um, holding the, the water holding capacity, of course, in the soil. This is an area, like I said, which is sometimes is drought prone, but also there are times when there's also uh, floods in these same communities. So she does all these different practices just to make sure that she's improving the land. And um, as she continues building their awareness, she's really speaking to, of course, the dangers of burning forests and also within the policies and laws that have been put in place in Zambia regarding burning of forests, as I've already said. So in one of our conversations and discussions with her, she really shows really ecstatic and excited to see the trees growing back in a land that was once bare due to charcoal uh, burning. So this is something they are doing together um, as a community. And of course, finally, how do we align to the uh, global diversity uh, framework as care? So I think for particular targets 8 and 23, I've already spoken, if you check what uh, UNIS is doing there and also our, our, our work, you know, is, is really speaking to minimizing the impact of climate change, yeah, as one. And then the target 23, that women's participation. So with UNIS being at the center of the change um, around uh, the impact around climate change, <clears throat> she's, she's in, a, in a position where she's got access to information, which is able to share when we compare with other communities. But also, I'm sure she also now becomes the mentor of the young women and girls within the communities and the women farmers that can also be able to take, take in those uh, uh, same uh, uh, lead positions uh, within their communities. So Eunice and many other women in, in, in the area in Southern province are the women that we're going to work with. And also with our sewing change, these are the women we're actually going to work with um, to ensure that at least we're moving from just that exploitative gender bit but to more transformative agenda where we see women actually being at the center of their own uh, development and with knowledge and also ensuring that the ecosystem is well improved. So I must just say um, thank you uh, to everyone. And I really look forward to working with uh, everyone to attend our GBF um, targets as stated, and of course, towards uh, transformative gender. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh... I think you, you gave us a perspective of the challenges of what is the framework of gender equity and the interrelation with the, the global uh, biodiversity framework in terms of the challenges uh, that you raise uh, with your case study in terms of gender equality and gender equity in terms of promoting the changes in the structures, in the policies, in the institutionality, the, the human behavior and promoting uh, the, the action from the, the, the gender perspective and the, the, the woman leadership in terms of uh, restoration and actions towards the reduction of the vulnerability because of climate change and biodiversity laws and the transformation of the structures, the policies, the interrelations. So 
thank you uh, for uh, such an important uh, case study. So in terms of uh, concluding uh, this uh, uh, first uh, uh, few sections, uh, I would like to highlight the interrelation between target 23, target 22, and target 8. As uh, we were reflecting uh, with the last uh, speakers in terms of the importance of the deadline, June 20, 2024, in terms of all the governments, in terms of a social action, in terms of policy action, in terms of a business action, community action agenda, in terms of how to really implement at the, at the national level, at the regional, at the global level, the global uh, biodiversity framework in terms of the urgent actions to really mobilize resources in terms of community and, and, and human uh, leadership in terms of stronging and safeguarding the human rights, uh, the girls and the women and the indigenous and other communities rights in terms of promoting a gender uh, based uh, uh, non-violent uh, environment and clean and healthy environment uh, linked to climate and in nature crisis. So really, we are really moving ahead with all our partners and uh, and the examples of the the care, the vision, and uh, and all of us the uh, biodiversity for. Uh, Okay. biodiversity for nature and for women in terms of really uh, moving uh, ahead. So I will go for the last uh, part of uh, the, the session today in terms of uh, moving towards having uh, the, uh, the main questions that we have from our audience. Uh, so I will start with you, Kirsten. I will uh, give you two questions that I'm uh, taking from uh, the chat uh, from our audience. So uh, the first one is, what is your perspective in terms of ensuring capacity, resource mobilization, and effective leadership of women in conservation? In this context, what is WWF uh, doing to support women and mainstreaming gender equality? And the second question, uh, Kirsten, how can WWF work more closely with development and humanitarian organization groups and, and how we can, uh, as WWF, learn from each other uh, to have a more concerted and impact action? The floor is thank yours. You so, no, thank you, Sandra. And thank you to whoever asked those questions. I think those are really important points because I mean, for us, working on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which includes women, uh, is hugely important. And it needs to cut across everything that we do, whether it's in the way we communicate, uh, in the people we hire, in the design and execution and monitoring of our programs, in our policy work. So uh, it's something that uh, we're really, really focusing on uh, as WWF across everything that we do. It's work in progress. Um, uh, but for me also as, as new director general, it's, it's extremely important that we get that right. So that, again, that includes working on, uh, on the inclusion, particularly of women groups. Um, concretely, it means that, um, you know, I guess there are different levels. Again, uh, we have hugely important policies when we hire people. So we have to make sure that women uh, sit around the table uh, in the right positions, in the right decision-making processes, in the right governance structures. So that is one really important aspect. The other aspect, of course, is in the projects that we support. I already mentioned Nepal, where we work particularly with women on climate adaptation, in DRC, where we're working on um, women's rights when it comes to natural resource management. Sandra, I'm sure you have great examples in Colombia where you explicitly work uh, with women the great examples on fisheries engagement of women in the Solomon Islands, in Mexico, where we work with female entrepreneurs, in Australia with women rangers. And I've talked to you already about how we're making sure that women are much more uh, included in all, tackling all the issues of illegal wildlife trade. Um, uh, and, and, um, and then I look at the policy fora where WWF is very active, right? If uh, particularly CITES and, uh, and URSA, focusing on, on, on rangers and making sure that we have uh, more women rangers, uh, uh, looking at, at CITES and making sure that 
gender is also uh, well reflected in that. So I think there are many uh, facets of this work in WWF. Again, as I, for me, it's very much work in progress. It's top of my agenda. Um, if I go to the second question on, on how can NGOs learn from each other, I think, you know, the reason that we're, we have three organizations here around the table at this webinar is already a great example. And it, uh, it mirrors the, the longstanding partnerships that we have. And uh, Chikwe, you already uh, introduced the work that we're doing in Zambia together. It's all about learning. I mean, that's what these partnerships are about conservation and development and working on rights are part of the same coin. You can't do one without the other. And it, it's, it's where we need partners, uh, partnerships for. And uh, we, we proactively search for partners that are not conservation organizations. Again, whether it's, it's World Vision with whom we have a, a very important partnership or CARE or whether it's the Red Cross. You know, there's so many important organizations that, that are distinct from conservation organizations that we actively need to partner with in order to get it right when it comes to, um, to gender equality as well. No, thank you, Chris, and I think uh, you make uh, very good points in terms of the learning and also uh, developing all these financial mechanisms and partners to make it happen and to learn from each other and, and the, the joy of uh, the added value of each of us. And uh, I will ask all our speakers uh, to turn on uh, the cameras, but also to engage in the chat with certain questions that we have there to start a, a kind of answering or provoking certain reactions into the chat. And uh, while uh, we continue uh, this uh, engaging discussion. So, so uh, Sophia, I have from uh, our audience two questions as, as well for you. Uh, and I will do it at the same time uh, as a matter of time constraints. So the first one, engaging men is crucial as we promote women's empowerment and reallocation of unpaid care work. How is care addressing this and engaging men and boys for gender equality? And the second question, Sophia, what is care doing to build skills and capacities for working with women in community who are coping with social injustice, grief due to the nature of loss, interpersonal conflicts on trauma? The floor is yours. You are on mute, Sophia. Um, are we having uh, internet issues maybe with Sophia? Uh, I think uh, we are uh, having uh, uh, internet uh, issues with Sophia. So uh, I will move uh, to, uh, to Tina. Uh, your question from the audience uh, that I'm seeing here uh, in the chat is, what is next? Now there is a gender target in the global biodiversity framework, as you explained to us, uh, how this helped to real action, how to work together on the ground to hold governments responsible for their uh, commitments in terms of implementing the, the, the biodiversity agenda. Up to you. Thank you, Sandra, um, for the question. Yes, there is a lot of work uh, now going forward. And I think what's really very important, and I think uh, these webinars are being also hosted, is that to at least also let organizations, networks, women's groups also know that this is now there. Now, like I said, that um, what we have been engaged with, um, say, for example, in a very small scale, um, is one key element is the national strategies and, uh, and, and action plans that each of your countries, 196 countries signatory to the CBD have, they have committed that. So I think, see, there are, there, are, there, are, there are a few levels, right? I think one of them is at the policy level. The policy level advocacy has managed to now get this standalone target on gender equality. Now that will also only get forward when there's also awareness about it at the national level, but also collaborations and support for local led initiatives. And I think this is also a role where um, organizations like WWF and CARE and World Vision, where you are situated, where you also have a broader outreach, not only in one country, but also in a larger global context. 
So we are also really hoping to build these collaborations where we are using our um, knowledge and resources to outreach and build collaborations and also hoping that it trickles down. That is, I think, the one really basic thing. Say, for example, if, you know, if WWF or CARE starts engaging, um, it's also it's institutional capacity building, right? So if you're also going to be saying that, okay, we are going to take this model as target 23 and that the GVF, because they also, the idea of the target 22 and gender equality is not only about, all right, let's look at it in a box. And I think one of the colleagues also shared to that, in the similar way that the target 22 falls under all the other 22 targets, you know, either it's eight on climate change, or you're talking about 15 accountability of businesses. That's a very key element. Uh, you're talking about seven on plastic and chemical and waste. So there are all these elements. So I think one key element would also be that we're also as ourselves at the um, uh, where we have outreach as a, as a national uh, networks, also build our institutional capacities, you know, have guidelines of how do you do your project management, or how much do, information are you sharing um, with your networks, regionally, nationally, locally. So it really needs to trickle down. So I'll just give an example of, um, of um, a video that I shared from Solomon Islands. From our side, um, like I said, we have been uh, more engaged in in, in, in coordinating the women's caucus membership to engage and to bring their capacity to understand the CBD. But we do, there is a lot of work needed. And for that, I think I always tell people like, you know, it's, it's let's not reinvent the wheel. We all have our strengths and we all have our challenges. It's about time that we need to really collaborate and work together. Otherwise, again, we will be um, working in silos. So yeah, so in the national network capacity building awareness raising funding, but at the national level, um, I would request all the participants here share this webinar further and, 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 and to your networks and also review your NBSAPs, which are all online, to just at least get a glimpse of what the countries have committed in the previous NBSAPs and just find out even one or two ways in which you would like to engage and, and build capacities or even hold partner with organizations, meet up with the, uh, it's always difficult, but as bigger organizations are here, CARE, WWF, World Vision, you have a much more outreach to the ministries and to the, yeah. So I think that would be very important. Thank you, Tina. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. As a matter of uh, time, I will come back to Sophia since the internet uh, from her side, uh, uh, what is said, uh, able uh, to give us her perspective. And Sophia, the audience uh, is asking uh, to uh, one uh, very important question that is engaging men is crucial. And as we promote women's empowerment and reallocation of unpaid care work, how is care addressing this and engaging men and boys for gender equality? Thank you so much for the question and forgive me that for a minute I, I, uh, I, I couldn't hear your, your question. Thank you so much. Um, well, we are actually talking about gender equality and not only about women and girls. And that's very important. Gender equality can only be achieved if everyone participates in a world where there's gender justice, where men and boys can also play their role in favor of gender equality. So that's a very, very important distinction from um, from precisely the empowerment of women and girls, which is critical so that they can also be, you know, full actors. And that's a critical path, but it cannot be achieved without the engagement of men and boys. It actually cannot be achieved. And that means that men and boys also play their role in the in care uh, responsibility. Uh, that's that's essential. They are also that that they are not bystanders when they hear and are exposed to, let's say, sexist remarks. You know that they also are empowered to stand firm and challenge. I mean, that's the world that we want to create in which everyone will be happier, and that of course is very important, especially in the activities that relate to women's more traditional roles at, at home, the caring of others, the caring of nature, frankly, as well. So all of it requires that we are all on board in making 
a more equitable and a gender equal society happen. Of course, a lot, as we all know, has been reversed due to COVID. In fact, the latest reports are uh, from um, the um, World Economic Forum and others are really uh, quite daunting because they indicate that with everything that we have just lived through and the multiple crises that we are exposed with of climate, of, of wars, of hunger, in fact, we have seen a reversal in gender equality by a generation. So if before all the crisis of the last three years, you know, gender equality was going to be reached in 96 years, because that's what before COVID we thought was going to be the case. Now, the latest um, data show that we will only achieve gender equality in 136 years. So this has been pushed back by a generation. So we must be acutely aware of the reversals and therefore double down our effort. And we can only achieve this if the communities of conservation, humanitarian response, development work together to make it happen. In fact, now we have even a greater responsibility to bring that to life. Thank you so much, Sandra, and forgive me for the quick no, no, no interruption worries. in my internet here. Thank you so no, very much. No worries. Uh, and thank you. I'm conscious of time. I want to thank you all the, the different voices, the different uh, views and, uh, and the uh, excellent examples and putting uh, the tone of the, the uh, the status quo of the implementation of the gender equality, gender voices, leadership in terms of implementing the biodiversity and climate agenda. Uh, we have all a role. This is part of these uh, webinars, a capacity building exercise that we will continue promoting. Remember that uh, this webinar has been recorded, that there will be shared. We are going to take the questions and try to have a Q&A in the web. Uh, for sharing uh, and learning and continue uh, this awareness because all of us, we have a voice and we have a role to make the action agenda in terms of biodiversity uh, protection and conservation and reduction of the vulnerability of the human uh, very uh, important to really act in the different voices. So Thank you very much to all of us. Thank you for the audience. And we will be uh, sharing and you will be listening from all of us uh, in the coming days. Thank you.